How's it going? How is the project? It's great. It's great? Yeah? Seriously or sarcastically? Sorry, I haven't looked at it yet. <laughs> you haven't looked at it yet. <laughs> 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 All right, well, we're going to talk today about um, the, the problem in the project, which is localizing a robot. We're going to do it at a very abstract level to try to, so basically what we started with the, with the first two lectures, with this very mathematical, very theoretical formulation of probability. And we got to these two rules, which, which sort of give us the, these tools for reasoning about uncertainty and, and making a, a, a system that can model uncertainty. And now what we're going to do is, is start to shift towards actually using this machinery to um, make computations and make decisions. And that project is about um, sort of localizing a robot in a, in a space. And we're going to sort of, in the next couple of lectures, give you guys sort of more um, um, take from this very abstract level um, and, and start to talk about tools of thought and, and also computation that we use, that, that people in the field use to actually make systems that can reason about um, uncertainty and probability. So, so um, the one that we're going to talk about today is, is graphical models and Bayes nets in particular. So um, I, I sort of alluded to this last time, like, like there's this <coughs> desiderata that says, we're not going to, we're going to always take into account all of the evidence that we have that's relevant to the question. We don't arbitrarily ignore some of the information and, and, um, and base the conclusions only on what remains. But actually, in fact, even though this is what we'd like to do all the time, in practice, all the time, people will, in their implementations and in their models, we will make decisions to ignore information that we have that would help, like in, in theory, it would provide more, more useful information. And, make it, and, and if we could make these computations, it would let us make better decisions. But computing it is intractable. So we'll decide to make this trade-off between ignoring information that we have or, or, or making assumptions that, that the world is simpler than it really is in order to make it something that we can actually program up in our computers and, and compute. And a lot of the tricks and, and the papers and the research that happens today and a lot of what actually you have to do to make one of these systems run is, is about when you decide to ignore information, why you decide to do it, and what what it buys you when you ignore it and what the trade-offs are in accuracy when you make those decisions. So, so we're going to kind of go through this today with an example. All right. Um, so the problem of localization is you're given the map of an environment. This is a map from uh, a robotics textbook. And you're a robot, and, and you're trying to figure out where you are. And you have some observation of, of the environment. So um, in your project, the observation takes the form of a range sensor. So what the robot is actually going to do is bounce laser beams off walls um, and, 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 and 180 degrees are around it uh, at, at increments of one degree. And for every direction, it's going to tell you how far away the wall is from the robot, or the obstacle is from the robot. Uh, with some noise. So, so there's some error in, in the laser beams. There's also problems with reflection. Sometimes your laser, be your laser beam will go right through a glass because it doesn't reflect the laser. Or if there's like a mirror or metal or something, it might reflect back and tell you that it's closer than it, than it really is. So, um, y and, and the challenge is given this noisy measurement, we're trying to figure out where in the environment the robot actually is. Um, so we're going to sort of today think about an easier version of this problem that just has fewer parameters and less assumptions. Um, so so the, in, in this world, this is, this is our little robot, and there's only three places he could be. He could be in the kitchen, the living room, or the bedroom. And he gets to make observations. So for example, um, the, the we're going to pretend that our robot has a chair detector. Um, and this is actually not that crazy. Um, there's a lot of work in computer vision doing object recognition. What? No, chairs are really hard. What's that? Chairs are hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Chairs look like a lot of stuff. That's right. So, okay. So our chair detector could be noisy. You're right. And, and, we, and we, could, we could do that, too. So we could say, um, I am, we, we, um, we, we could say, like, I'm in the kitchen, and then there's really a chair, and then if there's really a chair, maybe my chair detector fires, or maybe it doesn't fire because it, cause chairs are hard. Um, for the sake of this exercise, um, for class today, we're going to assume we have a perfect chair detector. I know that's a lot, but like this, this is just to try to take you guys through what the computation looks like, just for a simple example, and then, and, and actually we can talk at the end how we could we can make a, a, a not very much more complicated version that takes into account the noise from 
the, the, the classifier. So people work, uh, even if we don't have perfect chair detectors, a lot of people spend a lot of time making chair detectors. Um, that's one of the sort of standard object classes. Um, so so uh, they won't work all the time, but we can, for the sake of argument, let's just pretend that our robot has a perfect chair detector. And what we want to know is, well, given that I can see a chair, what room? What room am I in? So how can the robot make that computation? Yep. Yeah, so we can sort of observe the environment and try to figure out what the likelihood is of, of there being chairs associated with each of these rooms. And if there's a room with lots of chairs, then maybe that's, or a room, if a room that's more likely to have chairs, maybe that's an indicator that I'm in that room. So like maybe the living room has chairs and the kitchen doesn't, or something like that. So now, um, here's another one, like I see a bed. So, so that might give you a little more information, right? Because like it probably isn't, a living room or a kitchen if there's a bed, just using our intuitions about the problem. Um, but how are we going to combine these two pieces of information? So if I know that I can see a chair and I also know that I can see a bed, I somehow know more than if I just see the bed, right? So, so what, 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 is gonna, what, what will let me combine my knowledge about those two things? How can I do that? Yeah? Maybe analyzing the probability that each one of those objects individually would occur in each particular area you're looking for. Right. So, so, so when we've, the way that I framed it right now, they're all kind of coupled. And what you're suggesting is somehow breaking it down into these simpler components and then combining those components back together. So, so, um, so, so this is sort of a the sort of theme of, of today's class is that if we try to look at the the just enumerating all of the possible. Uh, states that the world could be in, there's a lot of probabilities that we need to estimate or come up with somehow. I haven't really talked about estimation yet, but like we, had to we have to like somehow start uh, uh, putting these numbers into the system. If there was a way to break it down into simpler components, then there's fewer numbers that we have to come up with, fewer numbers that we can get wrong. And sometimes we can make it so that the numbers that we have to come up with are easier to come up with. So, so we'll see how that plays out as, as we go. All right, and we could say, like, I could see a microwave. So formally, this is the world we're going to be working in today. So this is making it look more like, like the, the Jane's world, right? So, so I have the, I'm, I'm going to define these random variables, these variables wi uh, which are logical statements that can be true or false. Okay, so, so um, A, B, C, and D. So A is a little special. So, so A is, is, I'm breaking it down into these three little, um, three types of statements. So one is I'm in the kitchen. The second is I'm in the bedroom. The third is that I'm in the living room. So, so I'm making a move. I don't want to, I don't know. Like this is a move that often gets made without even talking about it. Um, so, so in the Jane's world, we were talking about predicates which could have truth values or it could be true or false, right? There was no possible way for a predicate to have more than one value. But what's special about these three predicates here? A1, A2, and A3. Yes. They're mutually exclusive. They're mutually exclusive, right. So what does that mean in, in logic? Yep. There is no way one can be true if any of the others are true. Right. So like A, A1, oh, mama, it died. So A1 implies not A2. Not A2. And not A3, and all the other ones too. So, so this is kind of a special situation that happens a lot, where we have a set of exhaustive and mutually exclusive outcomes. Um, so we can always get back to like this sort of pure Jane's form, but, um, <laughs> w but it happens so much that, that uh, we, we often sort of summarize it using something called a random variable. So a random variable, so, so I'm going to use the term random <coughs> variable as, as we're talking. A random variable is a process that can take on a, a value and, the p when we, and we can know the probability that it t it's a sort of uncertain process and we can know the probability that it takes on one of these values. And the different values are exhaustive and mutually exclusive. So here A is a random variable and the three values it could take on are A1, A2, or A3. I could be in the kitchen, I could be in the bedroom, I could be in the living room. 
And that's a modeling decision that I'm making. So when I made up this problem, I decided to do it in this way. When you are applying this to your problems, you have to make decisions about what the space of values of these variables is going to be allowed to be, and how big to make it, and how small to make it, and what to allow in, and what not to allow in. And those decisions are all throwing away information, right? So, so you could imagine a dorm room, right, where people have little hot pots in there, and they have microwaves, and they have beds, and they have chairs and beanbag chairs. It's kind of all three, right? And, and, so, and so they might, like in, in, in the sort of real world, maybe it's not exhaustive. It's certainly not exhaustive, right? We could think of other rooms that could exist. And it's definitely not, it's also not mutually exclusive. But we're making this modeling assumption to simplify our lives and make the computation easier. Does that make sense? OK. All right. So then what we want to compute is, if we're trying to do localization, is we get some observations. So, so these are just observations. These are, these are binary. I see a chair or I don't see a chair. I see a microwave or I don't see a microwave. I see a bed or I don't see a bed. I see a sofa or I don't see a sofa. And, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm trying to compute where I am given these observations of the environment. So what's the probability that I'm in the kitchen given that I can see a chair and a microwave? Which room do you guys think we're in? Who thinks we're in the kitchen? Who thinks we are in the kitchen? Most of you. Who thinks we're not in the kitchen? No. We're, we're, we're no. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, this a dorm room. Right, right. So, so I mean, we, we can't know from this example, but, like, we can kind of, our intuitions tell us something about what we'd like the, the, the numbers to work out to be. And what's challenging in probability is that sometimes your intuitions kind of match what happens, and sometimes your intuitions don't match what, what um, actually happens when you plug in the numbers. So be careful as you, as you um, come through this material that um, you're, because you, you sometimes want, your you want the model to match your intuitions, but sometimes it does very surprising things. Um, okay, so now if we actually want to compute this, um, sort of the simplest thing we could think <coughs> of is, is, is just compute it directly. Just say that part of our prior knowledge, by the way, all of these equations are implicitly conditioned on sort of prior modeling knowledge about the world, right? So we could just say that our, our prior knowledge includes directly these different probabilities. The probability that I'm in the kitchen given that I've observed a, what's B, that I've observed a chair or a chair and a microwave or a chair and a bed. So, so how are these three probabilities related to each other? Am I, I mean, so there's sort of domain knowledge that makes them feel like they should be connected. But am I allowed to pick different numbers for them, or are, 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 are some of our basic axioms going to prevent me from doing that? Yeah? Well, the second two are subsets of the first one. Uh -huh. One of those can only happen if the first one is true, so they are portions of that original probability. Right, so we had that rule where I can only increase, it has to be greater than or equal to the first one. That's right. So, so basically, and, and I can keep going, like there's just lots of them. These are all the different things I'd like to be able to ask my model, right? Like given any subset of these observations, I'd like to be able to have it tell me the probability I'm in a certain room. Yes? Do we not get negative observations, like I looked and I didn't see a chair? Yeah, that's, that is possible. We're not going to talk about it today. Um, hopefully you, you'll see how to do that. It's, it's, um, it's, it's. It, but it is different from not observing something. So, so a negative observation, I looked and I didn't see a chair, is different from I didn't get an observation of any kind. I didn't run my chair detector, essentially. Um, and we're going to live in the first world. You either get a positive observation or you didn't run your chair detector. So yeah. in this case, uh, the probability, given that I saw a micro microwave and the bed, does not imply that I didn't see a chair. That's right. I, did, I have no information about no my chair. So, so here's a, a way that this could happen. Like I might be updating my probability. I might, it might be expensive, for example, to run my chair detector. So it might take me a few minutes to, to do it. Or my chair detector might consist of taking a picture of the room and then uploading it to Amazon Mechanical Turk mm -hmm. and showing a person and saying, is there a chair? That would be a very good chair detector. <laughs> okay. And, and, and so I, might, I really might be waiting for my chair detector to finish or something like that. I don't know what the answer is going to be. 
Also, yeah. why, why say A equals A1 instead of just saying A1? I could have. I was just trying to be more explicit because of this um, shifting the, the notation a little bit. Um, to, to, to so, so there's sort of like the Jane's notation, which is, is not standard, I guess. So he uses A, P of A, B, but most people would write A, comma, B. And, um, and the random variable notation is A <coughs> equals A1. It's kind of emphasizing that A can take on one of these three values. It's exhaustive and mutually exclusive. Whereas just saying P of A1 doesn't really emphasize that it's exhaustive and mutually exclusive. It is, because I said it was, but like, um, this, is, this is just sort of notationally being clear about it. Does that make sense? A lot of what we do, this is what, something that confused me a lot about when I came to probability. A lot of what we do is to help us think about these problems as people. It's not like some underlying mathematical thing. It's something that makes it easier for us to, to get our heads around what's going on. Okay. All right. So now we're going to sort of talk about this. Um, oh, those are the three, the three ones. So now we're going to talk about the, uh, the joint distribution. So, so, so one way to do this, I guess, to, to be clear, is that we could just write down these numbers directly. We could just think about it and, and then try to write down the, these different probabilities. Or maybe we could try to estimate it from data, take some means and, and variances, and, and, and come up with these numbers directly. It turns out, though, that it's kind of hard to think about how you would do that. So if you guys try to like come up with a diff the difference between, let's say, C, I see a microwave, and C and D, I see a bed, it's not clear just looking at it like what, how you would um, do that, how you would write them in, in these different ways. And what I'm going to show you in sort of in class is if we think about it in a, a different way, we make some independence assumptions, we can put it into a form where we actually feel, uh, where it feels a lot more natural to write down these numbers. Uh, so, so that's, that's good because feeling good is good, right? Um, but it's also good, uh, it's also easier for us to estimate them from data. We need less data to estimate them. And also we need fewer numbers to represent what's going on in the model. So that's sort of the, the theme for, for today. So the first thing I want to talk about is the, the joint distribution. So when you have a lot of different variables and they're all kind of knocking around in your model, one thing that you can look at is the distribution of all of them. So this is a different notation from Jane's, but this is saying probability of A comma B, C, D, E. So in Jane's notation, it would just be the and of them all, E. And if I was being explicit with random variables, I could say probably that A equals this particular value, B equals this particular value, C equals this particular value, D equals this particular value, equals this particular value, the end of all of that. So these are just different ways of writing the same thing. So, um, so, so, so when we have uh, so, so for our A's, we know that it, it's these th three different rooms. For the B's and the C's, they take on two values, true or false. I saw it or I didn't see it. Um, so so I, 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 I looked and I saw it, or I looked and I didn't see it, versus I didn't look at all, which then it wouldn't appear in your distribution. So, so what form does the joint distribution take? What does this look like? What numbers do I need to fill in to, to write down the joint? Yep. It's just like a giant table of all the possible yeah. computations. That's right. That's right. It's a giant table. Does that make sense to everybody? So let's think about it in a simpler case. So I have um, <laughs> just A and B. So let's not worry about all the other ones for now. So what are the rows and the columns for the joint distribution for A and B? Yep. Uh, the B is going to be true and false, and A is going to be A1 and B1. Yeah, that's right. So here it is on the, oh, <coughs> I was going to do this law of total probability first. Um, okay, yes, that B is going to be true or false, I see a bed, or I don't see a bed, and the A is going to be, I'm in the kitchen, I'm in the living room, or I'm in the bedroom. And I, I use an even more shorthand notation, where really what's, like, if we wanted to, we could go all the way back down to the Jane's notation if we, um, and, and be in that world. Okay. 
So then I wrote this formula down here. Um, the summation over A and over B of this joint distribution equals 1. Why is, is that true? Do you think that's true? Yeah. yeah. It looks pretty, pretty true, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so, so, what, uh, so, so what allows us to, to derive, I'm not going to derive it for you guys, but what, what will allow us to derive that to be true? The sum rule. Yes, there's, that's one thing. What else will let us make that assumption? There's, it's not just a sum rule. Looking for somebody else, but thank you for talking. What else do we need in order to do this? Yeah. Is it called the law of total probability? Um, yeah, well, it, 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 this is related to the law of total probability. Um, but we need, in order to, to sort of prove that this is true, that the sum over A and B is 1, we need to make a couple more assumptions about A and B specifically. It's not true in general. Yes? We need to know that A and B are exhaustive scenarios. So like A forms a of Yes, of exactly. Yeah, so if I, wasn't summi if I wasn't able to do this summation, like in order to do the summation, I had to be able to, to pick an A and then pick another A and then pick another A. I had to do it <coughs> for all of them. So they mean it must be finite, and and um, um, and 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 then and then I, I can sort of get this result, right? So, and I think it also has to be mutually exclusive. So otherwise, I'm I'm double counting when I'm doing the summation, and I might get something larger than one. Um, so a lot of times, this is presented as like something fundamental, and it, it is important. We use it all the time. But it only works because we were able to sum over A and over B. And it turns out that lots of times we can't sum over A and B in, in practical problems. A, a big headache in a lot of implementations is when A and B are huge, like all the words that appear on the internet or something. And then you and, and you're trying to sum, sum over all of those. Or for machine translation, you're trying to sum over all the possible sentences that could exist in English, let's say. And and people have to approximate. These, the, uh, these There's a lot of work um, in, in ways of approximating. In this world, I made it small enough that we can compute it exactly. All right, so now we're going to talk about the, the entries in this table. So, so let's think about like this one here. So I'm in the kitchen, and I see a bed. What number can I put there? 0 0.01. 0 0.01, yeah. What else? Zero. Zero, good. What? I heard somebody else. <laughs> what? <laughs> point oh 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 one. Point oh 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 one. Yeah. I don't think one in a hundred people have their. What's that? Point oh oh would be like one in a hundred people have a bed in their kitchen. <laughs> 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 yeah. So 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 I could estimate this from data. I could go into a lots of houses, and and try to count up how m um, what these what these joints actually are. Um, if I'm just making up a model, so so I'm trying to use my intuition. I can pick any number I want between 0 and 1, right? It has to be a probability. Um, there's one constraint, though, right? What's, what's the constraint about all these numbers? They must sum to 1, right? So this is, this is like the, this, this rule down here. So I picked some numbers, and we're just going to use those so that my, um, my math on the, on the other slides works out. All right? Do you guys like them? No. Sure. <laughs> we're in a college. There's lots of dorm rooms around. Wait, the yeah. Really? Yeah. We have people living in our kitchens in the triples. That's yeah. horrible. <laughs> <laughs> How can we do this? <laughs> I know people who live in who live in who live in lounges too, so living room makes sense. Yeah. See. Okay. So so this was unknowingly appropriate for Brown's <laughs> unique <laughs> housing situation. <laughs> All right, so, so, so the reason that I'm introducing the joint is because it's really powerful. If I have the joint, I can get anything else that I want. I can just do some math, I can do some, some computations, and I can get other, I can answer any other question I want to about this model. So let's think about how that's going to work. Um, and I, I, didn't, I decided not to do code today, so we're going to really be working off of these tables. But I want to, to emphasize, like when I talk about this is something that I, find, I also found confusing when I was learning this material. Like people would, would write down like probability of A and B, and then they would talk about A given B, and then they would talk about B 
given A, and they would do all this work to convert between them and, and do all these different forms. And I would be like, well, why couldn't you just start from the other form? So, so the reason that we do this work is because, first of all, it's going to save us. It's going to allow us to make independence assumptions that save us parameters. And second, it's going to let us estimate things when we have to come up with these numbers. Because at the end of the day, we're always come up with, come up, coming up with numbers, right? It's going to allow us to come up with numbers in better ways, in, more, in ways that, that, that are more naturally fit the problem and in ways that actually work better. <coughs> um, so, so we're going to talk about that uh, as, we, as we go. But I wanted to give you the high level of where we're going. Why are we starting with this funny joint thing? OK. So, what I said was we, we really want to know A given B, right? We want to know the probability that I'm in a particular room given that I have observed a bed. So how can I do that in, in math first? And what I'm going to do is write it in terms of the joint. Yes? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so, so probability of A given B equals probability of A and B. So I'm going to use this new notation over probability of B. What's that? Yes, that's exactly right. That was my next question. Where does this come from? This is the product rule. Okay, all we did was solve the other direction. So A, we said the product rule is probability of A and b equals probability of a given b times probability of b. So if we divide both sides by b, <coughs> then we get this rule. That's all we did. OK. So that's the, white, the slide version of that same math. Um, OK. So now, what do we need to, so, so to actually compute this, using our table that we had before. So this is, the table, this is what we actually had. We have a little table like this in our Python program. So to actually compute A given B, and, and we've gotten to this equation, what else do we need to know how to compute? What do we know how to compute? We know how to compute the probability of A and B. Yeah, we know how to do this. This is just a table lookup, right? We can just say what A is and what B is and then pull out that number. Um, so what don't we have? To, don't we have it's, it's the only thing that's left. There's only two terms. Probability, Probability of b. Exactly. Excellent. So the next thing we're going to have to try to do is write <coughs> the probability of b in terms of the joint distribution, because all we have is the joint. So how can we do that? Probability of b equals something with a and b, and we don't know what. <coughs> we kind of already did it. Yes? Isn't the probability of b just the sum of the cases where yeah, b is true? Yeah, exactly. So it's a summation over b. Right. So this is marginalizing. Right. So summation, summation over a. Over a. a thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Summation over a. OK? So we wrote, so, so let me do that um, in, in math. And this, is again, comes from the, the sum rule. Um, and it's called the law of total probability, if you ever heard of that. OK. So now if we go back to this, um, so we have probability of A given B equals probability of A, B over probability of B using the product rule. And now we can write it um, all in terms of the joint by substituting this in. Summation over A, probability <coughs> of A and B. Probability A given B. Does that make sense? <coughs> yes? Good. All right, so now let's go back to our example and actually do it. So, so, um, so this is probability of B. And it's basically these, these two numbers. I see a bed, and I don't see a bed. Maybe what I'll do is write the, the joint that I was using on the whiteboard so we can actually come up with these numbers. All right, I see a bed. Bed, not bed. And then kitchen, yeah. Living room. 
bedroom. And then 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. Okay. Question? They were saying if you had a bedroom with no bed, sit on the couch. <laughs> you, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it exists, certainly. It's possible. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, OK. So now let's try to write down. So this is probability of A and B. So this is our A, and this is our B. So what's the probability of B? Point f yes, I kind of cheated by putting it up there for you. So, so first of all, what, what are, the, what are the, the rows are? I see a bed, and I don't see a bed. So how do I compute it from the joint? Sum up each row. Yeah. What's that? It's sum up the columns. Yeah, row. right. So, so I'm going to say I'm going to sum up each of these rows to get the joint. So point 0.1 plus point 0.1 plus point 0.3 is point 0.5. And then not bad, I sum up this row. Point 0.2, point 0.2, point 0.1, point 0.5. Does that make sense? So the joint tells me what the marginal, this is called the marginal distribution of on B. Um, I don't know why we call it marginal distribution. We could probably look it up on Wikipedia. Uh, but this is, uh, so, so it's basically just uh, what we think B is true without knowing anything about A, no, knowing nothing about what room we're in, and it's 0.5. All right, so now what's it look like for A, just for fun? <coughs> Kitchen, living room, bedroom. All right, so point three. So I sum up the columns now, right? Point three, point three. And I heard somebody say point, point, point three, point and four. zero point four. All right. So, so, so when you look. So, so this whole thing, this whole table has to sum to 1. What about these marginal distributions? They have to sum to 1, too. Yeah. But that's sort of by construction. That always happens. If you have, a, if you have good probabilities up here, you're guaranteed to have good probabilities down here. They're going to sum to 1. So this is 0.5 plus 0.5 is 1. 0.3 is 0.6 plus 0.4 is 1. And that just works out. I didn't have to do anything special. As, lo as long as my joint sum to 1, my marginals are also going to sum to 1. Mm -hmm. All right, so now let's write down our conditional distribution. So this is probability of A given B, A given B. So we're going to have to use our formula. Um, I'll write the entries first. Kitchen, living, room, bedroom. What if you make yes. a whole row sum to one, and the other rows be completely zeros? Yep. Then the whole sum is going to sum to one, but you're going to have one of the rows sum to zero. So like that won't. So let's see. Like if 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 this if if yeah. if these were all zeros. Yeah. Um. And then these all summed to one. So basically, you were saying that that I never. What that would be equivalent to saying is there was always a bed, no matter what room you walk into. There's always going to be a bed in that room. There's various probabilities yeah. of there being a bed anyway. Oh, well, yeah. Okay, no, never mind. Yeah. I completely Does that make sense? That wrong. Yeah. 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 And what happened? What would usually happen? Like in practice, if that was really what you thought, like then you would just not probably you wouldn't include that variable in your model because no, it yeah, would just yeah, be yeah. zeros and it would just drop yeah. out. So, so again, this comes to our modeling decision. So, so, so when we talk about throwing away information, that's one way of doing it. Like, like maybe I know that it's possible for, um, I don't know, for Michael Jackson to walk in the room right now. I guess it's not. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that would be. <laughs> 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 
we're, here, here's, okay, maybe I know it's possible for Christina Paxton to walk in the room right now. <laughs> um, but I think it's pretty unlikely that that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And in practice, I'm going to assign probability really, really small, almost <coughs> zero. It's practically zero. So I'll just pretend it's zero. And what that means is it just drops out of the model. I don't even need to have a row. <laughs> I don't even need to have a row in the table for it, okay? Um, and, and that's a modeling decision I make. That, 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 and that's kind of a facetious example, but like lots of times we decide all oh, these things, they, they really might happen, but we're just going to pretend they don't. And we're not going to model them. We're not going to have variables for them. We're not going to think about them. We're not going to spend any computation on them. Okay. So now let's talk about the conditional distribution. So if we go to the formula here, where's my formula? I erased it. So our formula for the conditional probability of A given B equals probability of A B over probability of B, which equals probability of A B over summation over A, probability of A B. Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. So we kind of already did the bottom already, right? Because we, we made this table that was summi summing over A. So we actually could, su we could just use this one. Um, but when you go all the way to here, it's just all in terms of the joint. So, so we, we uh, made this intermediate thing of, of 0.5, and now we, we can uh, sort of look up the values. Uh, so we can, let's use this one. So we can look up, so there's a bed, and I'm in the kitchen, so let's see, that's 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Divided by P of B, that's, there's a bed, it's all the same, 0 0.5, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. All right, so then um, living room, so same thing, 0 0.1 over 0 0.5. I should have made these easier to do in your head. And then uh, bedroom, we're going to just look up here, 0 0.3, 0 0.3 over 0 0.5. And now, not bedroom, same thing, right? I'm going to just do this row now. Um, 0 0.2 over 0 0.5, 0 0.2 over 0 0.5, and 0 0.1 over 0 0.5. So I did the, the math in advance, so we can put the... What's that? Yeah, you're, um, another way to think of it is, is you're summing them and then dividing by the sum of all of them. Right? Um, you're sort of forcing them to be a number between 0 and 1. You're renormalizing the distribution. So here, here it is. Um, so probability of A given B, given that I can see a bed, um, it says I'm likely to be in the bedroom. And if I don't see a bed, I'm not likely to be in the bedroom. So, so the point of this exercise is to show that if we started from the joint, if we can somehow get to the joint, then we can get anywhere else we want. In, in the model. We can get a marginal distribution over, over just A or just B, or we can get a conditional distribution of A given B, or we can get B given A. The probability that I am going to observe a bed given that I know that I'm in the kitchen. Okay? Question? That doesn't sum to one. Yeah, good point. It doesn't sum to one. So, uh, so uh, what's that? It sums, it, yeah, it does. So, so, so it's not supposed to. Okay. Um, so, so where <coughs> does it sum to one? Where does it have to sum to one? The rows. Does that make sense? So, so, so one way to think of it was when you're conditioning on something, you're in this universe where that thing is true. And all the other universes don't matter at all. So, so, so in particular, the universe where B is false doesn't, doesn't, doesn't affect the summation. So it only needs to sum to 1 in the universe where b is true, and then separately in the universe where b is false. Does that make sense? Okay. So a conditioning distribution is sort of putting you in this new, new world. They, they, it sums to 1 on its own terms. Whereas a joint distribution, where it's a and b, the probability has to be spread across all of the different options in the right way. So if you take some, a little bit away from this cell, you've got to put a little bit in one of these other cells. You have to think about both things at once. In the conditioning distribution, you, like when you're thinking about the world where you have a bed and you're coming up with these probabilities, you only need to think about that, that, that world. Like, what's the probability? If I know for sure that I'm in a kitchen, so I only need to look at kitchens, that there's a bed. 
Does that make sense? You were confused. Me? Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. Right. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, so we can do the other way too. It's just the same uh, kind of summation, but in sort of reverse, using the the, pri the probability of a, and and dividing by the columns. Um, so we now we're summing vertically to one, right, instead of horizontally. Okay. So now let's go back to our our robot and try to think about what this exercise has told us about this problem. So. So we want to compute um, probability of A given, given B and C. And I said, if we have the joint, um, then we can, come up with, uh, we can come up with any of the estimates that we want. We can get the probability of A given all of these different observations, and I can get the knots as well if I wanted, um, using the, the, the sum rule. Uh, but let's think about how hard it is to actually compute that. So how many numbers are there in the joint distribution? So if I think about probability of A, B, C, D, and E, how many numbers am I going to need in that big, so somebody told me at the beginning it's going to be a really big table, right? Like a multi-dimensional table. How many numbers are in that table? 24. What's that? 24. 24. I think there's more. Maybe I got it wrong, but I think there's more. <coughs> so let's count. So how many numbers are there for the A's? Three. Three. How many numbers are there for the B's? Two. Two. Yeah. What about the C's? Two. Two. D Three. and E? Two. 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 I think. <laughs> 48. Is that really how many? Yeah? Yeah, it's a little tricky. It's a little tricky. So, so there's 48 numbers in the table. There's absolutely 48 numbers that I can look up because I can <laughs> look up any number, any combination of those variables, and those are the different numbers of values that those variables can take. But do I really get to pick 48 numbers completely the way that I want as long as they're between 0 and 1? No, you're shaking your head. Why not? Well, they, have they have to sum to 1. Right. So if I know 47 numbers, what does that tell me about the last one? Yeah, it's 1 minus. So I really only get to pick 47 values, 47, to make them normalize. <coughs> OK. All right. So now let's do, um, so, so, so this is like a big one. So I don't want to carry this example all the way through. So let's think about um, 48 entries, but really it's 47. So let's do, let's do the same thing for a smaller example. So, so th this was A, B, C, D, <coughs> E. Let's do A, B, C. So how many is A? Three, three. three two, two. Twelve, yeah. So how many numbers? Eleven. 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 So, so what we're going to talk about next is, is there a way for us to have to figure out fewer numbers? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so how can we do that? Yeah. You can just look at the conditional probabilities. Yeah. So we're going to talk about ways to throw away information. Is that is that kind of what you mean? Or yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes given. <laughs> yes given my response, right? Um, right. We're going to talk about throwing away information. And one very powerful way of throwing away information. And sometimes it isn't even throwing away information. Sometimes it kind of matches what we really think is going on in the problem, and it lets us have to estimate fewer numbers. So what it is is, is independence. So there's, there's my math on the, on the slide before. So what is independence? Who's heard of it before? Lots of you. Good. <laughs> so, so maybe you. <laughs> um, all right. So, so two random variables are independent if the probability of A given B equals the probability of A. So it basically means they have nothing to do with each other, right? Like telling, knowing, knowing B tells me absolutely nothing about A. It's just does, it's completely irrelevant. So what does that tell me about the joint? <coughs> so the joint is P of A, B, 
What do I know about it? What's the Yes, it equals, it equals P of A times P of B. Okay, um, and, and how can I derive that? The product rule, yeah. So I can say this equals probability of A given B times probability of B. This is exact, and now I make my independence assumption and I get that. This is just substituting in the value. So this is important. Because a lot of times when you're reading papers or you're thinking about the math and, and stuff, you want to pay attention to when they switch to, from doing exact computations. So this is always true no matter what A and B are, as long as, um, as, long as it's sort of logically consistent and stuff. The product rule is always going to work. But now we're making an independence assumption. And we're, we're starting to talk about the tricks that they're using in this particular problem to make this particular problem work. Um, so it's important to, to, to pay attention to the difference between those two things. So the second notion of independence that's, that's, imp that's uh, more useful than, than just straight up independence. So it turns out to be relatively rare that two things are just independent of each other. And if they were, it doesn't help you all that much because th they just have nothing to do with each other. It's like, it's like you know, the probability that the next um, train to Boston is going to leave on time versus the probability that Christina Paxson is going to come into the room. Probably they don't have much to do with each other. We can probably assume they're independent, but it, doesn't mean, it means that knowing one is not going to help us with our computations anymore. What turns out to help a lot more... What's that? What if she's coming in the train? Yes. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, the <laughs> so you could al almost always come up with these... Ex I have to think of more impossible situations in advance that are really impossible. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so sure, you can come up with a kind of example, but probably very small. And, and, and there's actually, you can quantify... Um, independence in that way. So, so if they're almost equal, if this is almost equal to that, you can get, you can, you can just say, well, let's just pretend it is. Let's throw away the information, but make our lives easier. Make it so we have to compute a lot less numbers. Okay. Question? No. Okay. All right. So, the next notion that I want to talk about is conditional independence. So lots of times, we have variables that are related to each other, and so they're not independent. They're, they depend on each other. If you know something about one, that tells you something about the other variable. But that independence is, er, but that relation is mediated by something else. And if you knew the something else for sure, then they become independent. So conditional independence. So, so, so this is, sort of the math of it. A is conditionally independent of B given C if A given B and C equals A given C. So, so C is, if I, know, if I don't know C, they can be in, in depend, dependent on each other. But if I know C, suddenly they become independent. Okay? So this is something that is important but maybe a little confusing. Um, so, 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 for example, if I'm in the kitchen, <laughs> and uh, what I could basically decide is that whether I see a bed and whether I see a microwave only depends on whether I'm in the kitchen or not. So if I'm in the kitchen, that can tell me the probability that I'll see the bed and a probability that I'll see the microwave. If I don't know if I'm in the kitchen, th they're correlated, right? Like maybe if I, if I see a microwave, I'm probably in a kitchen and I'm not going to see a bed, right? So they're correlated. They're not independent by default by, um, without knowing whether or not I'm in the kitchen. But as soon as I know in, I'm in the kitchen, I can sort of make this assumption that they're independent. Yes? So is that notationally A given B and C? Yes. Or A given B and C? It is A. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is A given... B and C, that they're both true at the same time. Yeah. Uh, Good question. I'll write, the, I'll write it with a probability. Okay. So if we make this independent assumption in our domain, so, so we assume that if I know that I'm in the kitchen, then, then, then B and C are conditionally independent. Let's see, like, that's basically going to save us entries in our table. So, so let's see how that works out. Um, right, so here's the, I guess what I, what I was going to do first was write the joint in this. So, so A, B, and C, this is the law of, 
uh, the, the product rule, right? So now, what can I say about this using my independence assumption? So if I substitute that in to, to this equation down here, what do I get? Yeah? So, so, so does this change? Does this, <laughs> oh, I think I got it wrong. <laughs> Let's sit on the whiteboard. No wonder you guys are confused. I'm sorry about that. So let's see. Uh, so what I wanted it to be, probability of A, B, C given A. Yeah, I, okay, so I wrote this rule with the wrong variables from the ones I decided to use later. So it's not e exactly, r well, <coughs> it is wrong, uh, um, but it, th this rule is correct in and of itself, and this rule is correct if we say that B and C are conditionally independent given A. Okay, so, so, so okay. you know what I'll do is, um, is just, sorry about that, is just change the slide quick so that I don't want to confuse you guys. I'll just change it to x, y, and z. x, y, z, x, z. How's that? All right, so x is conditionally independent of y given z if probability of x given y and z equals probability of x given z. Okay, uh, all I did was substitute a's and b's and c's with x, y, and z. <coughs> so now if we assume that, that b and c are conditionally independent given a, then what we can do is write, so this is exact, we can write the joint, we can make our independence assumption on this term right here, and it becomes b given a times c given a, okay? So it kind of looks like total independence, where we just, we're, we're taking the joint and we're saying we can just multiply them together. But, it's, it, uh, but it wouldn't be true, in, in this particular example, it wouldn't be true if we didn't know C. Does that make sense to you guys? No. Okay. So, maybe... I'm confused yeah. by the commas. Like, what, yeah. like, if it's B and C yeah. given A, or B and... Yeah, so the commas are always um, notation for B, C, B and C. And this is the notation that's used more widely in the field and like by people. <laughs> like order of operations wise, B comma C takes precedent over the given. Um, well, what does takes precedence mean? Like binds yeah. more tightly. What's that? Binds more tightly. I, 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 yeah. So so. so like there's the given. Yeah. So the given is like like there has to, the, the given. You can't put more than one given inside a probability. Okay. You, <laughs> So, 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 so the given is always like the sort of highest level thing. There's the stuff on the left side and the stuff on the right side. And what is on the left side is some logical formula, always. And what's on the right side is some other logical formula, always. The notation I use to write the logical formula varies widely. Um, and, and I like the James notation too. Right? That's why I had you guys read it. Uh, however, this is the one that most people use in the field. I don't want you guys to like get stuck on, on that when you, if you go out in the field and you see all these comments and not understand them. So I'm switching us to the standard notation after we've done the theoretical grounding with James, if that's okay with you. Yes? So there if it was B and C given A, you'd put parentheses around C given A? No, I would put them around B and C. But if it were, if you wanted to express B and C given A, no. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> What's that? What? Is C given A not a so, so, <laughs> so this has to be, so, so what's, what's outside of probability is a number, a real number, right? Between 0 and 1, sums to 1, and all that stuff. What's inside the probability is logical predicates that are true or false. So B given, or, so, so the given notation is, it's really funky. It's, I found it confusing too when I started. I still find it confusing to be honest. Um, so, so B, the, the given notation doesn't really make sense outside of a probability. 
Because I'm only quant like sort of using it to quantify my degrees of belief about stuff. So if the rate half was C given A, it would already be a number and you can't take a probability. Exa number. Yes. Okay. I mean, I could convert it to a logical expression again. So I could say, what's the probability of B and C given A equals six point six, right? Um, but 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 C given A doesn't mean anything until I put it inside a probability. Then it's a number, and I have to do something else to convert it back to a probability. A to, a, a to a logical expression if I wanted to put it inside, so we, again. So we don't specify because there's no way that it could be the other reason. Yes, exactly. So ambiguity yeah. means yeah. nothing yeah. because yeah. there's no Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Can you say again which variables are conditionally independent on which? Yeah, so in this, in this, in this world, um, B and C are conditionally independent given A. That's the assumption that we're making to go from here to here, in particular to go from this, these two, this joint here, to these two factors here. Why, yeah. why does that probability look different from the x, y, z? Like it's not. X, so if I substituted, yeah. X yeah. given <laughs> y and z. It's this, yeah, so, so, so I screwed up the slide at the beginning. I, I, to ma I made the slide really confusing by mistake. So, so, so if these had been A, B, and C, what you guys were thinking is that that meant that these were the same A, Bs, and Cs, which is, which is not what I intended, sort of semantically. Because I wanted us, for this domain, I wanted us to assume that A is conditionally independent. I'm sorry, B and C are conditionally independent given A, and the rule was stated in the other direction. Does that make sense? So I just renamed the variables to make, to make it clear that this is just a rule where any x, y, and z could be any variables you want. It's just defining conditional independence. Does that help? Yeah? I think it's confusing because the form is so different. Yeah. <coughs> you have x yeah. given y, z, and then in the equation you have b and c given a. So that's not oh, is it? substituting, then you're using that in the product rule. So you're using that first line that's written up there, and you're subbing it in. Yeah. To get that different yeah, I'm process. skipping steps. So maybe, maybe what I'll do, maybe what'll help is to write it on the whiteboard. So, okay. So we have probability of A, B, and C equals, the, by the product rule, probability of A times the probability of B and C, this is like B and C, yeah. given A. So now I'm going to make my independence assumption that A, that B and C are conditionally independent given A. And I can write that in a lot of different ways, because I can, because that has lots of implications of, of things. Okay. So the way that I wrote that up there is is um, probability of it, it's 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 also symmetric, but that way isn't symmetric. So clearly, I'm going to have to revise my slides next time I do this lecture, so that we just give it the other way. So so um, so so probability of B given A and C equals the probability of B given A. Okay. And then uh, what I can do is derive from this. Um, so if I, if I, probability B given A and C given A, so then I can write this in terms of B, given A, um, so I'll, I'll use the product rule again, probability of B given A times probability of C given A, B. Okay? And then, that's still wrong, but... Yeah, but if you, yeah. if you switch it Yeah, so if I switch it around, it all, it all yeah. kind of works out. Okay. So. I hope, I, I think I'm going to move on, but I think if it's still confusing to you, I apologize that the slide was confusing. I, I realized that that kind of messed things up. Yeah. If it's still confusing to you, I recommend you go on the whiteboard or on paper at home yeah. and derive it yourself. And that kind of practice at, at sort of working out these manipulations is a good way to get more comfortable with the material. Okay, so now that we have this form where we've, we've gotten probability of B given A and probability of C given A, how many entries are in our table now? for just three. So remember we had 11 when we were doing the joint. 11 entries before. So how many entries are in P of A? 
So there's three entries. Yeah, uh, entries is an ambiguous sentence so, or word, I guess. So there's three numbers that I can look up, but how many do I get to pick? Two. two. Yeah, so there's two entries in P of A. What about P of B given A? <coughs> so I hear people saying one. So it, for so 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 the, the tricky thing about it is that A can be three different values, right? So the full table would be five. Would 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 be. Six, because I could do all the different values of A and all the different values of B, and I can get some number. But in terms of like the degrees of, of freedom for it, because they have to sum horizontally, remember, the number of entries is less. That's four that you're allowed to pick. Yeah, I think so. Let me make sure I... Three that you're allowed to pick is what I thought before. Because it, B is a binary variable. Can you draw the table? Yeah. Okay, so, so probability of B given A. Yeah, that's probably what we should have done in the first place. So bed, not bed, well, kitchen. Yeah. Bed, not bed, kitchen, living room, bedroom. So, so, so there's six that numbers that I could write down, but for each one of these columns, once I write down point three here, what does this one have to be? What's this? Yeah, point seven. And if I write down like point one here, what does this one have to be? Point nine. Point nine. If I write down point eight here, what does this one have to be? Zero point two. Okay, so I get to pick three numbers to be whatever I want, and the other ones are, to make it sum to one, because it's conditional, the, um, are, are, are picked for me. Does that make sense, everybody? So by making this assumption, um, I've saved uh, the number of entries that I have to compute. My life is, is easier in, in that way. The other thing that, that's nice about it is it's easier, like if you're thinking about going and counting things up, um, so, so, so like if you are trying to learn this from data, so you're going to go into all the different rooms at Brown and count up the number of ones that are kitchens and see, and, and see, and see these different furnitures and, and stuff like that. In some ways, it's easier to, to think about, like, like, like if I only care about the kitchens and the bedroom and the living rooms, and I, I just have to go into those rooms and, and see what furniture I observe. Right? So I can sort of sample all the kitchens, as opposed to having to um, collect a lot more data to fill in the rows of the full joint distribution, especially when sometimes like some of those rows, there might be very few examples. So like it might be very unlikely that there's a bed in the kitchen anywhere. So you, you sort of, um, it, so, so sort of get that joint entry, you're probably going to underestimate it wrong because you just wouldn't collect enough data to see any observations of it. So we have to estimate fewer numbers, and the ones we do have to estimate are often, not always, but often easier to estimate. And the trick of, the, the whole point of this, like, I, I, when we decide which equations to do and which moves to make in our, in, our, in our math, is to make it so that the entries that we have to put in our table are easier for us to get. So I'm kind of hand-waving about, about the, the ones for this particular problem, but that's uh, what drives a lot of the math that people are doing. They're always using the sum of the product rule, but the reason they're going in this direction or that direction is to make it so that you can actually get these numbers. Um, but in this problem, we're just making them up. So, so this stuff is so important that there's ac this conditional independence stuff is so important that there's actually a graphical language, Bayes nets or graphical models, for talking about the, the assumption. So we made it in words poorly here, and that was very confusing as I observed. Um, however, there's a graphical way to say the same thing. And it's called a Bayes net. And this is a picture of the one for this particular example. So people talk a lot about graphical models. And they're really useful because uh, as sort of tools to let us see the assumptions we're making about the domain. So a Bayes net ha is, a, is a directed graph, a directed acyclic graph. And the nodes are the variables in your model. 
And the edges are encoding what variables depend on what other variables. And all the other edges that aren't drawn are, are, may, mean that you assume that those variables are independent of each other. So in this graph, if we wanted to, so, so we, this, is, this is the graph for, for um, assuming that B and C are independent given A. What would the graph be if we wanted to not make that assumption, the sort of full graph? There's more than one because I could factor, I could use the product rule in different directions, right? But like, what's one? How do you know from the graph that it's given A? Um, so, so the, I, I maybe I should say more things to define the graph. So, so the, the convention is that when I draw one of these graphs with nodes and edges, <coughs> if there's no edge, I assume that they're conditionally independent. I assume that all the nodes are conditionally independent given of all the other nodes given your parents. So A has no parents, so it's independent of everything. So I can just write P of A. So, so, so this is representing the joint distribution. A, B, C equals P of A times P of B given A, because that's, that's B's only parent, times P of C given A. So if I wanted to not make that assumption, how could I modify the graph? Yes? I just have a goes to B goes to C. A goes to B. And then B goes to C. And B goes to C. Well, do I still need this edge here? Let's no. draw that. Let's draw this graph. So A goes to B goes to C. So, so let's write out uh, first, let's write out the distribution that this corresponds to. So saying P of A, B, C equals P of A, P of B given A, P of C given B, that's right. So is this exact? Is this always true no matter what A, B, and C are? No, it's not. Yeah, that's right. So what can I do to make it exact? Yeah? Yeah, I think that works. So now, C given... <coughs> A, B, and A. Do you know what C to, or B to depend on C to work? Then I have a cycle. Oh, we're a cycle. Yeah. Okay. All right, and this is something I can just get from the product rule. So this, is, so this graph is encoding the product rule where I made the decision, which I, I'm allowed to do, to start with A and then say, um, and then say B given A, uh, B given A, and then C given B and A. So which right. one are the conditionally mm -hmm. independent from each other? Yeah. I am not making any assumption, any conditional oh. independence assumptions. I'm putting all the edges that I can't, I'm allowed to put in, and that corresponds to the joint. There's no right. assumptions about it. If I start a rate, this is like the full on graph. Um, it does involve a decision about how to factor it though. So another decision I could make is to say probability of C, I'll, I'll write the math first, and then probability of B given C times probability of A given B and C. So this corresponds to a different graph. Let's draw that graph. A, B, C. So how do I draw the edges to, to for, this, for this graph? From C to B, yep. B and C to A, that's right. Does that make sense? So, so the different graphs correspond to different factorizations, but both are representing the joint. I haven't lost anything. I've just made decisions about what tables my code is going to keep as I, as I make this computation. Where, where am I going to start, and then where am I going to end? Yes? So you don't assume any conditional independence. Do you get, like, is, it, is it more space efficient to store <coughs> the joint in these ways? Like you save yourself entries in the table, you write it. Um, yeah, I actually don't know. I was, I thought, I think so, and I was trying to make that happen before class with an example, and I failed. So I have to go look in the book and and and, and tell you the answer. <coughs> um, for sure, when you make independence assumptions, you save. I actually think you do save um, when when you have uh, uh, even when you're using the full joint. But I am not positive, and I'll go look it up. Okay, so so. What I'd like you guys to do, um, actually, why don't we go through another example <coughs> first, and then I'm going to ask you guys to come up with a problem with, with your partners, 
come up with a problem and then um, some independent assumptions and stuff for it. So, so this is the one. This is one for I'm in the kitchen. I see a bed and I see a microwave. There's another one which we can use with the same graphical structure. So like, so here A is I have a cavity, and then B is I have a toothache, and C is if you ever read that they scratch your mouth to to see if you have a cavity. So C is a steel probe catches in my tooth. So what this is saying is if I have a cavity that's independently going to make me have a toothache and also independently cause that steel probe to catch when, I, when the dentist is scratching in, in my mouth. If I didn't know whether I had a cavity, then B and C depend on each other, right? Like, like if I have a toothache, it's more likely that, I, that a steel probe is going to catch. But once I introduce this third variable, then I can, I can make this independence assumption and win because I need fewer entries in my table. Does that make sense? So lots of times, these graphs correspond to these kinds of causal relations. I have a cavity. The cavity caused my toothache, and the, and the cavity caused the steel probe to catch in my mouth. But I'm free to do it in my computation in any direction I want. Right? The probability will just work out. It just means I have to start with different numbers and do the different but like sort of still allowed computations to get to the, to the numbers at the end. So I'd like you guys to actually take a stab at this. Um, so so pick, a, pick a model with relatively small variables. Come up with a story like the toothache story or like our, our localization story where you're trying to estimate something and you have these other variables. And, and then tell me what the graphical model looks like for, for um, that problem. Turn to your partners and, and go. Okay, guys. Thirty more seconds. No, no, they can be related. Before you do a plane crash, if you know, there's more ways. All right, all right. Let's finish up. Who wants to share? Who wants to share with the class your model? Yeah. Uh, so we come up with um, it's snowing <laughs> for A, uh, B being I'm running late to class, and C is I'm having trouble finding a seat. And we're going to also make the assumption that there's no reason that you would be late to class unless it is snowing. So what's the model? The, wow. the graph looks so like. So <laughs> 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 it would be the same graph as uh, on the uh, on the screen. There, so uh -huh. um, so A is a snowing. Goes that to B, yep. and A goes to C. And if you are, if you don't know what A is, and you're running late, then um, you'll have trouble finding a seat. But if again, we're assuming that mm -hmm. snowing is the only reason that you're running late. If you know that it's snowing, then that completely determines whether you're running late and separately completely determines whether you have trouble finding a seat. 
Uh huh. Well, can't you <coughs> arrive on time when it's snowing? Isn't there a probability of that as well? No. <laughs> <laughs> also, wouldn't snowing make less people arrive early if there would be more open spots? Yeah. So these are good questions, and that and that's sort of why people use this graphical language because you can think, you can ask those questions in words, and that corresponds to a particular graph. So 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 we we could decide. Well, maybe um, it's no if running. The only reason you'd lose your seat is running late. That would give you a different graphical structure, or maybe we decide. Oh, look, there's more. Vari like I could run late because my alarm broke up, uh, didn't work, and then I could add some new variables to my graph. So people use these a lot for like brainstorming when they're trying to figure out like what the structure of a problem is, and and you can think about like what you need in order to give to initialize your probability distributions, and then we know how to do inference to compute the the marginals and and the sort of the and the conditional distribution based on what we want to try to estimate. Does that make sense? Somebody else want to share theirs? Yeah. Umbrellas. All right, and I have my graph. And where are my edges? Uh, a, to B. a to B. So if it's raining, it's going to cause puddles, and separately, it's going to have people carry umbrellas. Yeah. All right, so now let's go back to our original problem that we started with. So I'm in the kitchen, I'm in the bedroom, in the living room, and I can see a bed a microwave, a chair, and a sofa. So how can we compute this? How can we write down a graphical model for this? What's, what's uh, one way to do it? Draw nodes for all things. What's that? Draw nodes. Draw nodes? What do you mean? Well, we need nodes to draw a graphical model. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to at least have the nodes. Good. OK, so I'll do that. A, B, C, A, B, C, <laughs> D. E. Yeah, I could I could do it like that, um, and and then and then uh, and then and then that would have more complicated a more complicated graph, and it would work out mathematically to be the same thing. But usually people don't do that; they'll compress it to one thing because A is exhaustive and mutually exclusive. They'll say the value that A takes is uh, whatever it is, whichever one of those A's it is, um, is the only thing I'm going to worry about. So where do I want to put my arrows? Yeah, so I can say that once I know where I am, if I know that I'm in a kitchen, then that predicts the probability that I'm going to see any of these observations. So I can just do something like this. And that's really nice, because if I add a new observation type, so if I decide I'm going to implement, I don't know, a car detector or something, or a traffic light detector. I was in a, in a house with a traffic light in the, in, in the corner. It was pretty cool, because it was really big. Like, you haven't seen how, <laughs> like, the scale of it was, was, was kind of impressive when you were actually in front of it um, in a room. But anyway, you, you can <laughs> A, B, C, D, E. You can implement a new detector and just kind of add a new factor on, on board. So now, let's write, write out the distribution that this corresponds to. So the joint distribution of A, <coughs> B, C, D, E, and F is what? A given B, A given C, A given D. A given? Just A, given. Just a right? Just so a. I start with just, because it's, it's my parents, yeah. Yeah, the direction yeah. of the arrows. And then? Everything was just given A. Yeah, everything given A. Everything given A. C given A. And I'm not going to write them all out, because we don't have time. All right, so here's the slide for that. So then we can come up with these tables, right? We need P of A, P of B given A, P of C given A, and I can do all the rest of them if I wanted to. This is the input to the system. This is what I'm actually going to put into my computer program. And then for different um, things that I want to compute, so the probability of A, given that I've observed um, a bed, I can just write it in terms of the joint using my model. So this is just the algebra of what we did before. And then I can look it up in, in the tables that I have. So this is the joint, and then this is the factorization, the independence assumptions that are induced by the model. And then I can look up each of these in my tables. 
and I can get a number for A given B. Um, and similarly, if I have A given B and C, I do the same kind of thing, and I get um, something in terms of my tables. I have the A, A, B given A, C given A, and I can compute this probability. Um, so, so, I, so, I, so I sort of represented the joint in terms of these factored distributions, and then you can use that to get to any conditional or marginal that you want using the model. So we can use, our, use this whole, whole framework to look like this. All right, next time we'll talk about what happens when it's continuous. Thanks, guys. Hey. Um, why did you choose to make the arrows from A to all of them instead mm -hmm. of